morning and thank you for that introduction and nice meeting you members of the police service that I met this morning. I would like to say that um, June, June has been designated the month uh, to raise awareness about mental health of men. So good morning to all you men here and I wanted to say good morning to one of the most powerful women in our country but she had duty call so she had to leave. So our commissioner of police, one woman who oversees a lot of men in this service. And this is something that um, I find fascinating because when he, she got her post, it, it, it showed there was a paradigm shift in the police service. Paradigm shift in the sense that um, it was one of the last areas where a woman would have been put into leadership position. We're still waiting for female chief justice. But however, what I must say is when, um, when she came the commissioner of police, this is something where some men did not accept that because our cultural um, biases would have kicked in. And this is something that I will explore later, that the male mindset is something that can keep back, um, keep you back or mentally give you some sort of distress. So many men who have been hurting inside, suffering in silence, many men do not seek help. Some of you men look strong and fit, as the commissioner mentioned. You may have big muscles, but you suffer. Some of you suffer in silence. And a lot of men refuse to seek help. So why I'm happy this morning to be here is the whole idea of trying to get help. I am here to convince you guys, listen, you are not alone in this. You need the help. We need the help. The country needs the help because we need good, strong, mentally fit um, police officers to be out there. So therefore, why should you be here? Why would you be here? Because as, as the Commissioner Foley said, men were t tending to think that they were strong, they can handle things. Society say they, are the, they were traditionally the breadwinners. They were the persons in charge and supposed to have that facade of strength and more so with police officers. So police officers now, so I may try to put on a strong face. I may try to say I'm the man of the house, but the police officers, they put on a, they have to put on that strength for society and the whole to show their leaders and leaders go with strength. And the commissioner tried to say it goes with muscles, but the, the thing is, statistics will show that men kill themselves three times as much as women. And this is why it is important you are here today. Those figures startled me. Those figures startled me in the sense that um, uh, we not only find men killing themselves more than women, but if you look at the homicide rate, more men are victims. So we have to ask, are we now the uh, endangered gender? So we have to look now the fact that approximately every minute globally, somewhere in the world, a man will kill himself. So therefore, these are facts that I want to sink in, that when you're looking at your colleagues next door and you say, oh, we're strong, man, we can manage this. No, it, 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 it doesn't have to be so. So you belong, or we belong to a high-risk group, and we should prepare to recognize depression in ourselves and our friends. What we found is more women tend to come in with depression. So more women come in depressed, but more men kill themselves. And why this is so, women will get depressed, but they will have a support service. They will go and call their sister, they will bar talk their uh, husband, they will go to um, church and pray with the pastor. I had a, a female too. She was coping with a, a loss, and she went to the OB man. But the thing is, that's our culture. She went to the OB man to try and get back her her, 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 her husband and thinking that the other lady did something. All those things I don't fall on because you see medically while we treat with medicine and therapy there are other avenues in society where people reach out to. So that lady um, is, is an example where I was quoted and, 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 and the fact is she actually went through that period she reached to me but she was not that depressed. So this is something about this lady I wanted to, 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 and she was a nurse, she was 28 year old nurse, and, and she reached out eventually, and I said, love, you went through the whole spin already, you burn out with your depression, you burn out with your hope, and she's now, she actually um, reached that stage. But think about this now, a 28 year old doctor, his girlfriend left him. He 
he got angry. He directed his hate towards his supervisors. They put him on a hard shift. He actually stopped speaking to persons. He isolated himself. He didn't want to appear weak. He didn't want to go to his colleagues, even though there were psychiatrists working in the hospital. He didn't reach out. Psychologists, psychiatrists, and he didn't want to. He kept it alone. He started to drink. He started to drink and alcohol has an effect where, you know, some men, when they're depressed, they go into the rum shop and they may have one or two drinks, they could chat, they could talk, they could bar talk their wives even sometimes. And one to two drinks is way how men use to get therapy. Not to say I'm condoning it, but this is our culture. So for instance, I had a uh, patient who told me, Doc, um, I, when I go home, my wife is nagging me. The minute I, I reach home, she wants to tell me about the children, about the dog, about the neighbor, and I really can't take this. So he started, when he's coming home, he wanted that space. And he started actually staying out in his car longer. Then he started to go in the rum shop with his friends. So he would have two drinks and then come home. So that was his way of coping. It didn't go to a way that he came addicted to any sort of alcohol, but this was his coping. But this doctor I mentioned, he actually used alcohol. And alcohol is a depressant. And he actually tried to commit suicide. So you see, you had two individuals. One used the bottle, one actually used other avenues and reached out for help. So therefore, the fact is, um, we have to understand that your ability to handle stress depends on what support system you have out there. Your ability to handle stress depends on, on the fact that you're reaching out. So reaching out has always been a challenge to men. So this is why we're trying to show you the figures that I've showed you. You need to reach out more. We need to get you to reach out more. So let's look at... Let's look at what um, a, a, a study had, had shown before us. A fellow called Basinska said police work has been regarded as one of the most stressful occupations, often resulting in health-related problems such as poor mental and physical health among officers. This was a study in 2017. So you belong to this high-risk group. In 2011, another study found that U.S. police officers had more health-related issues than the general U.S. employee population. So you all are more at risk than men your same age in other occupations. And the same study went on to UK where they found that 70 to 22 percent of officers have significant mental health problems related to organizational issues. And this study actually showed when you're in your department and you're complaining about shift, you're complaining about the supervisors maybe coming down on you, um, you have, sometimes you, you're going off, you don't have a vehicle to, to, to manage the population. Sometimes you find that the, the physical condition is not, is not well, you have no way to vent your feelings. That or the occupational problems could lead to this. So it seems that that the macho um, persona that some men want to portray prevents them from getting help. So the, our gender culture serves to shackle us because we grew up in a culture where we think that, um, that men are, are, are supposed to be, um, um, you know, have that front. So around 60% of depressed men do not seek treatment, 60%. So sometimes men don't even recognize that they're depressed because sometimes depression comes as back pain, neck pain. So you may go by a general practitioner and if he's not versed into seeing your problem, he will just treat you for back pain and give you Motrin or whatever. But the source is really depression. So therefore, it is not even recognized among some of our own colleagues. So it's a lot, a lot of men out there will have to now realize that this tough image, we have to see, is this part of my spectrum? Is my somatic symptoms, my symptoms are headache, back pain, um, 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 part of it. So therefore, there was a study done there where they found that organizational stress, like if you were not getting um, things in your, in your office, could cause more sleep-related problems. But if you had actually trauma um, being shot at, you have more nightmares. So there, there were different studies all over the world done looking at police officers. So you remember, why am I worried about you more than the other men? is you have in your tools of trade lethal weapons which could make you turn on yourself, the guns, and on the public. So this is why it is vital that we reach out to you. It is vital that you look out for your own brothers in the service to say, listen boy, you're not looking so good, you know. Because one police officer who sh um, will shoot himself could have what you call a, a contagious effect and others could. Not just police officers, others in society could try to kill themselves also. It, it comes like a message, this is the way out.
out. And other, if a police officer turns his gun on someone and just get on irritable and shoot because he has that anger built up, it embarrasses all of us. So therefore, um, last week, I was, I was honored to be a guest speaker at the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services where my colleague, um, Senator Donna Cox, launched a suicide prevention hotline. And this hotline is something I want you all to remember. It is 800-COPE. It's a free line. So you can receive that assistance. So 800-COPE. And the initiative was there because we found before the pandemic, the World Health Organization told us that depression will be a major cause of morbidity worldwide. So we as mental caregivers, we were expecting depression. And I was knocking the doors of my cousin, Minister Terence Yeltsin, and said, listen, we have to get better clinics, we have to get better medication, we have to open stress clinics, and the government started doing that. But when COVID came, it accelerated everything. So we are more in dire straits now than before the COVID. So I, at that launch, I, I, I told a story of my interaction with a police officer and I want to tell it again now. This police officer came one day in Barataria Mental Health Clinic and he wanted me to see, he brought up um, someone who I think the magistrate had sent for some sort of counselling and he said he was waiting too long. Doc, I have things to do, see me before. I say, but listen, there are other people here who have to catch um, taxis and everything to go home. And usually I will accommodate police officers. So we went here discussion. I did accommodate him with his, um, his client who he came with. And he had my number. Lo and behold, some months after, no, but a year after, I normally see my clients in, in a session and I hardly come out of the room. I just happened to come out of that room to go to the toilet and on the way back an OGT said, Doc, I know you don't take the phone, but this guy is in desperate. I don't know what made me do. I took up that phone, I listened to him. He said, Doc, I went home just now and I found my wife in bed with my best friend. Now, that, he's a police officer. His best friend is a police officer who knew all his business. His wife also is somebody who he thought was loyal to him. So he went in the car, he sat down, and he started to think that he pulled out his Glock. I think it's a Glock 17 is the bigger one, right? The 19 is the smaller. He pulled out his Glock 17. And he was contemplating going and shooting them and shooting himself. Because this was a guy he worked hard for his house. He really, you know, loved his wife and he loved his best friend. He confided. Look what happened. No. He called his brother to tell his brother, tell mommy I'm no longer around, I love you. Mommy was a housekeeper who slaved, had all over working, ironing to get money to get her sons in school to get, and she was proud of this police officer. So he knew his mommy was the factor. He said, tell mommy I love her, but I can't, leave, I can't live. He called his brother, he brought it in answer. He called his pastor, the pastor didn't answer. He called me, and thank God to this day I answered. I had to convince him to leave the Aruka area where he lived and to come down to our Baratari clinic. And on that day I knew how these telephone operators that the minister launched feed because I had to keep him there. I said, come, let's talk. And I lied to him. I said, I went through the same thing. He said, Doc, you, your wife? I hope my wife forgive me, but I had to do that because I had to keep him engaged. And you know, our traffic, eh? so it was taking longer than anticipated. We got him down. We kept him for four hours. I, I worked with Dr. Bonte at the time, who was the, the psychiatrist for the um, police service and the RB. And we actually were able to take that gentleman, help him. They removed the fire for him. We give him counseling. And today, he has a, a top job in the police service and he helps other people. He helps other people, like other officers. When he see their mood, their face, he would say, boy, you need help? And he has been helping people. And he told me the other day, he said, Doc, I, if that day you didn't take that phone. I said, but if I didn't take that phone, you would not have been there to help other people. You are like a soldier of hope to the other people. And this is why, this is why, to this day, I am thankful I took that phone. And you have to look around to your people to see who may need, may, may need help. So let's look at this room. How many might be in this room? About 40. One in five of you with some kind of mental illness. I see you looking at your friend here. He probably already had. But one in five of you will succumb. That's a fact. 
because it's statistic show um, one in five persons globally will succumb. Now all of us could succumb. I could be successful as a doctor, I could be in parliament, but if my child gets sick, if uh, my wife gets shot, if I feel that I'm not getting the service, I, I, I have to help my family, I could go into a pit of depression, I could be um, a patient that's sent down to the hospital. All of us, any of us. So therefore, the fact is, um, um, we have to determine which one of our un unlucky colleagues will it be. Don't figure you are Superman, because you are not so, you know, I mean, I heard the, the, the commissioner of police talking about muscles and strong and strength and pushing, but remember, Superman had his, um, what is the green stuff that we can Superman, anybody know? Kryptonite. kryptonite, right? So, so your kryptonite is your job. If you have job stress, this is your kryptonite. Your kryptonite is not only your job, because remember your job, uh, it's a difficult job. And I want to give you the cycle of stress that you guys occurred just now. So your, your kryptonite is your job. Imagine a young fellow going out in the field, people shoot at him, bandits now seem to have bigger weapons than some police officers. This is a stressful environment. Your, your kryptonite is also your colleagues in the office, that work environment. Are they listening to you? Are they providing the tools that you would need? Your kryptonite is what happens in your home as that police officer realized when his wife cheated on him. If family um, relationship issues, very important. So therefore, relationship issues are important in the sense that what it does, it actually, um, how you are in your relationship, your home, will determine how you'll function outside. If you have to study every time, look, my wife may be cheated on me. If you have to study, look, I need more money um, to, to, to maintain her lifestyle, you are going to be in trouble. So, so not just relationship problems, but family issues, family conflicts. There was a police officer in you, worked hard, his parents worked hard for him, they were, they were um, principals of schools. When they died, his sister, his brother, wanted to put him out of the home. Family issues, he never expected that. They said, well, you working as a police officer, and one sort of court matters. So all these things um, would come. And then if somebody has a medical problem, let's say you, one of you guys discover you have um, hypertension or diabetes, you call that comorbid depression, which could trigger. So anytime you, you discover you have some sort of illness, more so if it's a terminal illness, that could trigger depression. What again could trigger things like um, depression? It could also be things like, um, like if you have um, a family history, let's say your parent, your mother is suffer from depression, or somebody died bipolar, you could get it. But you don't necessarily have to get it. Because what I do in my clinics, if I find there's a patient with bipolar, and they have kids, I want to track those kids. But sometimes we don't have the resources. I want my mental health officer to go to that home to make sure the children are studying, make sure we put, put support systems in place for those kids. Because having a genetic predisposition to something could trigger it. But if we give them the support mechanisms, they may never necessarily have to get depression or um, trigger any sort of illness. So we have to try and nurture these persons whose family have mental illness. So if one of your relatives have mental illness, dear children, you should look at them, try and see if you can give them that positive, that affirmation um, to, to keep them like that. So therefore, why it is I wanted to come here today? Because between 15 and 29 year old persons, suicide is the fourth highest cause of death globally, 15 to 29. I have three boys within this age. I am not exempt as anybody else, because my children could decide all of a sudden, children are always on Facebook and Twitter and all these things, cyberbullying is there. You find that they may have girlfriend worries, they don't know how to socialize, how to read faces. So younger persons are now killing themselves. And, and, and not just that, we have young officers come in to the service, you have to watch out for them. Over 700,000 people die globally by suicide every year. And they say every second someone dies by suicide, and every minute approximately a man will die. So therefore, Trinidad and Tobago do, ranks third in the English-speaking Caribbean region for the highest suicide rates. Guyana is higher than us, but at least we have to appreciate in our country, we have to be aware of that. 
So police officers are known to suffer from chronic stress, known to suffer from um, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, alcohol and substance abuse, and have attempted suicide. In fact, we had a few police officers uh, did kill themselves, um, did um, uh, die by suicide um, in the uh, preceding years. Um, your job can precipitate this. Your job with the chronic stress can cause you to produce more adrenaline and cortisol, which can increase blood pressure, diabetes, heart attacks, and strokes. If I, um, what thing you, what is the use, what is the use scare the worst? What if, if I have to ask you, what scares you the most, Mr. Pitt? Now, if I see a tarantula spider, that will race my heart. I'll want to run at you because when I was small, I had one. What, what may scare you? A plane crash. A plane crash, okay. Okay, so we all have different things. Could, could, but remember, if he's on the plane and he starts to have turbulence, his heart will start to race, he'll start to shake, he'll start to sweat. That's your adrenaline start to shoot up. Why the adrenaline shoot up? Because that is how we were made to have what you call a fight or flight. Cortisol comes up. So let us say these hormones come up, right? It means if I see a tarantula, it may happen, and then I will just, after I chase it or kill it, my hormones will go down. What will happen if every day I see a tarantula in my room? What will happen if every, every day you have to travel? You know? So this is what police officers face. They face the situation where they come to work, but because of the crime outside, they have to be hyper-vigilant. They have to be aware. The ones on the road, eh? now they're, so they're looking around, they have to be alert for these criminals. And be that, you shoot up your adrenaline level and your cortisol level. That takes 18 to 24 hours to come back to the normal level, to come down. But if you go home, and you have to go to work next day, and you have the same stress coming up, it means your level will never reach that pre-existed level where a normal working man could reach, or if I see a tarantula, it could reach, because you are now that hyper state, your hyper vigilant state, and this is what harms you. The higher chemicals can cause physical problems, the higher chemicals can cause problems how you mentally are. Now this is what happens. When you have adrenaline, you feel, you feel alert, up, you, you, you are ready for action. So sometimes in work, it is a good feeling, but it is supposed to come down. That is the natural way of things, that cycle. If it's not coming down in you, you're in trouble. So let us say you have that level remaining high all the time. What tends to happen? Two things can happen there. You could know um, when you go home, is the time when you suffer to just unwind, to relax. You don't want any wives to nag you. You don't want anything to tell you about children. You just want to, that space. And when I do, when I do couple counseling, I, I, I have to tell the wives of police officers, you see that space when your husband come home, they need it more than me. Because they are more on a hyper level and they need to come down. So if you really have to get, part of the messages to get through to the, your wives to tell them about your job is different. Let us say you don't come down to that level and next day your level is high, you will end up reaching a state where you'll start to get irritable. You might lose sleep. You might feel, um, you know, angry. And there is where you lash out to the public. And there is when the public come and say, oh, those police officers, they're too aggressive, they suit this. But the nature of the job requires you sometimes to put on a deep voice. Hey, 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 what are you doing there? Let me give you a ticket. That's the nature. You have to put that, that aggressive thing. But you see, if it never comes down to the normal levels, that becomes you. So your political persona takes over from your home persona, which is supposed to make you relax. So if I could go home and relax, look at my index flex, put some tape over my wife's mouth, I mean, you know, I'm just joking, right? Because after she hears this, I'll be I'll looking for a space by you guys. So if, no, my wife knows to give me my, my breathing space. So if, if I know I can go home and relax totally, I don't have to take on things, then I will now get my home persona. And your home persona should be um, hobbies you have, um, playing football on the block, um, just listening to music, just playing music. But if you don't have it, you're going to lose that and you'll just become this bitter, hard individual who's going to lash out. So, so we look at that cycle. But another thing too, when you are home in the downtime, you tend to feel down and depressed. You don't have energy to do anything. 
And then when you're out with your batch, you have energy, you have feel you're gone, you're feeling good, sometimes you're hyper alert. After a while, your body tends to tell you that hyper alert state is, a, is the state we want. Because when you go home, you feel it down. So some people start to associate home with negative emotions and work with positive emotions. And some people, some police officers rather be there on the job because of that alert state. But we want a balance. We need to get a balance, right? Now the thing I want to tell you is that, that men and women handle depression differently. So I want to get this slide. If you look at, look, look at this slide, you would see here, and this is very, very important. You see, because uh, when I see those ladies in yellow talk about equality between men and women, I don't believe that we have different hormones. I have more testosterone than you, you may have or you should more estrogen than me. So equality medically. I I mean yes, you could be trying to get the jobs and extra, I have no problem. But we are different beings. There's a nice book, Men Are from Mars and Women Are from Venus. If you ever get that, read it. You will see the differences. We negotiate differently from, from our men half. So if you look at the differences between a male and a female, women tend to blame themselves. Uh, men tend to blame others. Women tend to feel sad, um, apathetic, worthless. Men tend to feel angry, irritable, ego insulted. So they lash out, they fight, they want to beat up their neighbor. Um, um, that's when they depress, we're looking at depression. Um, women tend to feel anxious and scared. Men tend to feel suspicious and guarded. Always thinking, I wonder if my wife called and missed him. Sometimes my wife not want to do, but you're depressed and you think that. Um, um, so you feel slow down and nervous, that is the, the woman. Men tend to feel restless and agitated. So you see them walking up and down, the hand clenched and they're walking and the nose flaring. Um, um, women have trouble setting boundaries and men never, never um, see the need to, to feel, um, in, men have the, the need to feel in control at all costs. So they want to be the boss. So imagine you have to deal with somebody who is depressed, one of your colleagues, and this is what they presented. It's difficult. Um, um, women find it easy to talk about and, 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 and uh, talk about self-doubt and despair. So women open up more, and this is why some of the figures show they uh, they, we say there are more women come and say depressed, but more men tend to kill themselves. But because the women come more, they talk, they come to the clinic. Men find it weak to admit self-doubt or despair. It's not a manly thing, it's a macho thing. I can't go and, and lay it out. I can't tell my partners this. Um, they, and women tend to use food, friends, and love to self-medicate. You know, you have the emotional eaters. Men use alcohol, TV, sports, and sex to self-medicate. Difference. So when I did this lecture, a lecture like this some time ago, when I mentioned this, there was this gentleman who was looking at me, trying to get my attention, but I had to leave. He found his way in my office. He said, Doc, I just cheat on my wife. I like to drink and I have plenty of women. You could come and tell her depressed, please. So please don't use that last one there to come to me to say you're depressed to make an excuse for your wife, right? But if you're depressed, this tends to happen. So therefore, just as I mentioned, the doctor who started to drink, all I get an idea is, eh? you're depressed, love, I couldn't do it. Come see Dr. D. I'll say, he has it in a, in one. you could take pictures, you know, so at least you could show him. So, so, so when you see sometimes men go and in the bar to drink, sometimes I'm not too angry with them once they don't um, overdo it. And if they get a, 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 a listening bartender or a colleague to vent, to talk, that may help in a certain level. But when it goes excessive, when you just go and drink it alone, you're not venting, you're not getting it out. Because sometimes your wife have your, your tail between your legs home. But when you're in the bar, you took it all kind of thing, like if you're the man at the house. But if you need that, if you want to go in a sports bar, look at TV sports, this is how you probably get it out. You channel your energies into that instead of thinking about what's happening in your life. And, um, but we don't like, and we don't like, um, we don't like self-medication alone. We are now trying to encourage you, come to us if you find symptoms are being there. Like if, if, if I find that um, there's a patient coming, an individual saying, Doc, I'm not sleeping well. My sleeping pattern changed. Sometimes I'm oversleeping or undersleeping. My, my appetite has changed, either under, under eating or overeating. If I just, I'm feeling down all the time. If I'm feeling that life is not worth living. If I, if I um, think that I, um, I'm worthless, I have no purpose to live. These are signs you have to come out to us. And sometimes depression just makes you tired, fatigued, tired. 
So I, I had a young police officer, he's about 20. He came to me just tired. We did test. Thyroid could make you tired. Low blood count could make you tired. Worms, if you do in garden, you get one hook, many system could make you tired. We did all the tests, it wasn't that. So I was looking to see if he was depressed, but he wasn't depressed, but he suffered something called burnout. For depression, you have to make a certain criteria of more than two weeks with two out of five symptoms. He was depressed, but he had something called burnout, which I want to mention to you uh, later. So burnout is something that if your job is too hard, if you stop enjoying your job, you can get a, a, a phenomenon called burnout. And with this burnout, you find that persons may say um, they don't enjoy work again. They, they get up on a Monday morning and they do not want to go to work. They feel that it's a burden to go to work, right? And we have now um, absenteeism. These people are not going to work. They reduce in productivity. They have uncharacteristic behavior, accidents. I had a police officer came to me trying to get his colleague moved because they didn't want to move him from some sort of patrol they had. And he said, that guy always on his phone, he's not even looking around. And if people start to shoot, I do not feel that I am being, will be defended by my colleague. But I didn't, I was hesitant to get involved in that police business. I said, no, your, your superiors have to do it. But remember, he felt his life was at risk because of his partner. So therefore, he started to have impaired judgment, made bad decisions, low morale, lack of cooperation, excessive tiredness, complaints of physical aches and pains. And in a situation where um, we found that he had something what we call burnout. And, and, and it was in 2000 and um, it was in 2014 to 2018, the then president of the Post Police Social, Social and Welfare Association, Inspector Michael Seals, my colleague sometimes in the Senate, he announced that officer absenteeism is a result of stress and health health related issues and it increased from 1,000 to 7,000 per annum from 2014 to 2018. So this is why I am happy that you are addressing these issues because you see those are the figures there. But it, it's not just us, it's if you were working in an environment like medicine in a hospital, you are not get any drugs to, to, to give the people your your other colleague doctor reading the papers when he should be helping you, the nurses chatting about something, you, you would feel that uh, you could get that burnout because then you have to be going to work, you have to, to, to be, um, uh, you know, doing more than you're supposed to do. And even WHO said the increase in absenteeism rates might be related to burnout. And this was a study they did in 2016. And the, the, the person who actually looked at burnout was a fellow called Maslach. And in 2001, he defined burnout as a prolonged response to chronic emotional and interpersonal stressors on the job. So that police officer, he's not getting the support from his friend, who he may figure he could get shot at that fella, not giving it back up. All those are stressors on the job. Um, um, the, there was a female officer who claimed her top rank officials used to try to ask her for deed. She felt stressed out on the job. So therefore, you may be susceptible to burnout due to the nature of police work, which requires officers to interact with the public and in stressful and emotional situations. And all these are, are, are studies that was done. And over time, you can get this that emotional exhaustion. You don't want to go to work, you think slowly. But therefore, the thing is, and uh, this is why I'm happy, Mr. Pitt, that there is something called a Mashlage Burnout Scale. So it's a list of 22 questions that, you, you, that, that I'm hoping that officers could be able to have a, a checklist. Like every three months, every six months, you will be able to do a checklist. And some of the, some of the questions there, you know, there's a scale. Um, some of it is, I feel worn out at the end of a working day. I feel tired as soon as I get up in the morning and see a new working day stretch in front. I can easily understand the action of my colleagues and, and supervisors. I, I get the feeling that I treat some clients, colleagues, um, impersonally as if they were objects. Um, a lady came to me the other day, Doc, my son gets shot, and the police officer and I'm cracking all kind of old joke. So they call it like dark jokes. But we, we in medicine do it too. We get accustomed, as, you know. After a while, the first time you see that, you are gassed, you come into grips. But after, you have faced death a few times. It's part of the job. So I was trying to tell us it's nothing with the officers. It is really, uh, even though they should have that decorum and understand, I said, the stress of the job, the hypervigilant state, this is some way they cope by, by coping, by cracking these jokes up there. 
So therefore, um, part of the master of scale, I feel that I influence others positively throughout my, my work day. So it's either yes or no to scales. And I, I, I have become more cautious to people since I've started doing the job. So there's a list of questions. I feel, you know, frustrated at my work, etc. So you have good things and bad things. But when you get at scale, if you score low on it, it means that you are going to be suffering from burnout. And you could be at risk of yourself, you could be at risk to your 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 um, other colleagues, you could be at, at risk for um, the public who you serve, and this is where we have to be careful. So um, at this stage I want to say different persons may have different ways of coping. Different ways of coping in the sense that um, if you come from a home where you are treated with love and and, and, and you have the religious aspect because religion is important as a support if you are not suffering from poverty. Because all these are factors that could, could, could be factors that when that it comes like baggage you'll be carrying. So poverty, child abuse, having an alcohol, father, neglected, neglected parenting, authoritarian, uh, you know, parenting, authoritarian parenting where they're beating you and they're not giving you questions. All these are factors as a child growing up could affect your mindset later on. So you could come into the service with this package if you had some trauma, um, all these things. So therefore, therefore, the thing is, um, it depends on your your own resilience. So some people come in strong and they could face anything, others could succumb. It's the ones who succumb we have to look at. It is the ones who put on a facade we also have to look out for if they are behaving differently. So there was this guy, well this is a doctor, he was a very coming to work early, he's a dead patient, he used to get vexed with us if we were chatting, because my wife and I went through med school together, so sometimes we're the same ward and we holding hands and looking in each other's eyes and he used to get vexed, he said look, wrap people here, come. So, so all of these things that, that, that you know, in, in a case like this, I enjoyed my work because I had my wife right through as a girlfriend coming up there, met her med school. So even though it was hard shifts, my wife there. So sometimes you enjoy your job if you have that um, batchmate um, friendliness there. If you want to get out from home, as I mentioned, if the home is now connotated with the negative um, dip. So therefore, um, it, so it depends on your, your past ability. And what I always say is all of you guys should get three persons that could be your support. You see that officer who called me? He got through to me. He tried two others. And this is something you always have to say, who could I call if I am in a situation where I want to harm myself? Have those three names. It could be a cousin, it could be somebody in your batch, it could be somebody. You could call me too, and I wouldn't be able to probably answer, but I have a WhatsApp, you could WhatsApp and I will get help for you. And my number is 680-3996, 680-3996. So sometimes if I'm busy, I will definitely get back if you WhatsApp. So what about the, your job that makes you different? Your job is you are in a constant danger zone. You are in a stressful condition. You are facing criminals with, with, with more sophisticated weapons. Out in the street, you are in danger. You are in this hyper alert state. And even when you go home, criminals know where you, are loved, where you and your loved ones live because Trinidad is a small place. So, so the danger zone of your job is one aspect that police officers have that a normal population wouldn't have to face, or even doctors wouldn't have to face. Then we said that you all are in a psychological dark zone. What do I mean by that? You all are seeing the evils in society. A husband chopping the wife. Somebody taking a child and killing them and putting them in a barrel that happened in South. You see accidents. You are the first responders. A, 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 a officer came to see me once. I, he was 23 years, but he witnessed his first um, homicide where he had to go in. The guy was eating KFC and he got shot and his brains were splattered all over the box. That police officer, that, that was about seven years ago, up to the day he cannot eat KFC. It has formed a bind in his mind. The minute you open the box, he seeing, imagining the, 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 the things. So little, you know, things like that could affect you. He went to counsel it, but he's never going to eat. So I said, well, what, it was so healthier for you. You know, not eat KFC, so, yeah. So, yeah, another officer came down. The first time I had to go and pick up a body, in somewhere in Central, the smell that uh, he described it as a sweet smell of death that came there. He said, Doc, if I see a dead dog anywhere, I want to vomit now. It affected him differently. Other people may get acclimatized to the job, other persons may, may, may come for therapy after they, they had in certain instances, and they could adapt. 
but some people can't and we have to realize those persons if they really can't adapt we have to see how we could maneuver them in the system do we do we put them in a safer place so and this is when organizational or workplace stress comes into place where um, you may have you think the, the, the seniors are, are, are actually giving your colleague a better treatment than you because you go and drink with him so you know all that inter office politics could come into place and you don't have anywhere to talk you don't have anybody to vent to so i always say there's the epa go and vent make a report at least you have it somewhere so in case in the future something happens you could say well i did come out and and, and say that our officer came to me and he is so angry with magistrates he said oh, we take two years before we got a case to go by somebody we got away the gun we carried it to the magistrate and we built that case and the magistrate sent that man home with hardly anything man back out on the street so this is where you feel cheated you feel the system cheat you and then you feel you, you and those officers who actually built this case and got this guy away helping society you feel what is the sense why should i waste my time and energy to go after criminal if 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 the the judicial system sometimes so all these things where you could feel cheated so the the, the organizational um, um stress is there and um Again, several studies have noted an association between stress and shift work. So some people, uh, you know, sometimes you have to look at officers who have that shift work, are they getting that downtime? So therefore, um, the thing is, um, co the causes of workplace stress is the job itself, then your individual responsibility, they give you something to do that you may not be able to handle, your working conditions, not nice, management attitude, and the relationships among your staff. So therefore, we have to appreciate that dealing with the public sometimes could be very challenging. Because the public there, you are doing your best, you are trying to help society, but they want to demonize you. So if I'm a police officer, I will sometimes develop a wall between me and the public because every time I go and I'm doing something, it's no thanks. You know, no appreciation for job satisfaction. They, they don't see you as a person. They see you as the uniform police, a big back police. They lump you together. You could be a loving person, but no, they lump you as the good back police. They put you as a boogeyman. So all these are stress when dealing with the public. Then you have the financial problems that officers face. Four percent in salary increase may not keep up with the goods and services out there. So you have that issue for officers to deal with. And the temptations is there. I had an officer who, um, very young guy, he came from a religious background, he had his wife, and this, because of the uniform, this girl threw herself on him, he got into affair with her. And then she started to ask him for more money to mind her two children. And his wife didn't know about the affair. Then she started to tell him that she's going to call the wife. Where would he get one money? This guy, you were Chinese, a grocer. I went to the grocery, you know, boss, we will pass and look at your business more if you give me a little thing. Because, you know, because that China grocer was robbed twice. So the Chinese grocer gave him it. And he took it, but he felt guilty. Now, some other officers do feel guilty. Yeah? Some of them, call it your persona, some of them may not. That is, some people may go into, like some doctors go into the service, medical service to get money. Some, some police officers, they're happy in their job because if they know they could go by Mr. Grosser. But what happened to him is he started to feel guilty. He wasn't sleeping. He started to get depressed. And what ended up happening to him one day is feeling guilty, getting depressed, not sleeping. He eventually, he eventually started to hear a voice telling him, boy, they will find you out your business. Boy, your wife will find out your business. So this was what was going on. One day without sleeping for about three weeks, he started to hear real voices. And well, voices in his head telling him, you're, you're, you're a thief. Um, your father never will be shamed for you. So that happened to him. He got a psychotic illness where he started to hallucinate. And it was all because of his guilt feelings. And he couldn't take it on. So then he got sick. He actually had to go into St. Anne's Hospital. Totally psychotic. But it was his guilt made him like that. It was uh, him having to step out made him like that. So financial could be a problem. Then another thing is failed goals. If you guys had a, uh, a dream that you wanted to to um, achieve a house, a car, a, a family at a certain age, a bank account of so many, and you're not getting that, that failed goals could fuel depression. That failed goal will be the crypto, one of the kryptonite. So therefore, a job dissatisfaction. People out there expect 
police to solve the, the, the crime for them. And sometimes you want to do it, but sometimes you can't. And you have to be real with them. You know, you didn't get a good picture. You have no fingerprints. And sometimes you are put in that position where you feel guilty. So all these are kryptonite that will be on you, Superman. And you see, the other thing is, mentioned by the Commission of Police, many men uh, uh, have the outdated mindset that you all have to be the boss, you all have to rule the home, you all have to get more money. And if your wife is getting more money than you, you feel insulted. You feel she's now in the workplace. She's not home like mommy, taking care of the kids. You feel she has to be home because she may cheat on you. Because we see society now has uh, is filled with persons cheating from both sides. So you start to feel um, 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 uh, insecure. You know she's dressing better, she's getting her own salary. She might walk out on you if you slip up. And you find most marriages now last four years, uh, four years. So even all those factors and you, with the, that mindset where you think you have that, um, the, the, uh, we need a paradigm shift in how we think, how we think in terms of females. Because now, more females are getting into law and medicine and engineering than males in the university. So we have to prepare ourselves for a world where females will be at top. So those with a mindset, may, uh, still old mindset, may, may, may have some stress. You now have a female commissioner of police, so you all are getting used to it. Other persons are getting used to it. So I, I heard mention too that, um, that um, the fact that men uh, are dying, and I think somebody made mention about the, um, the fact that um, uh, uh, men would be dying, the mortality of men is such that I want to bring a very important point. Men, our, our life expectancy is about 73.9. So, I heard you said your father lived up to 80, 86. So he lived more than we'd expect, right? So, it's probably a happy home, supportive children, all these things might be good things, genes. So our life, ex most of us in Trinidad and Tobago, we would live up to 73.91%. And we have come a long way from the days when uh, we used to be dying from syphilis and other communicable disease like TB. So we have we've come there. But women, live up to 76.4 and men 69.66. So the question is why are men dying earlier than women? A man told me because there's now has so much I want to go on next place. Right? But the fact is this is a fact. So we will try to figure why because men have more risky lifestyles. Men also, um, as I'm saying, use alcohol more, they begin more accidents. But remember the homicide rate, men are being killed more than a, a women. So that alone should tell you there is a gender issue dealing with men's mental health and a gender issue dealing with why men are dying earlier than the females. And we see it, we see a lot of widows come to my, my clinic, they're depressed. Their husband died and they, the children, uh, living elsewhere and they get depressed so they come clinic. we call it the emptiness syndrome as I think the people would realize so 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 we realize that but the idea is we have to now challenge is to find out how are we going to get how are we going to get our our males to live longer remember you have to take care of yourselves if stress could give you heart attacks and stroke your cholesterol levels are important your prostate levels are important once you cross 45 you should do a PSA blood test not a digital a PSA and at least you will be able to look at yourself so you have to you have to understand exercise um, is important but but as I'm saying we um, we have to realize too, the males of this generation was unprepared for the shift that takes place. So we have to educate the boys in school. We have to notice that there's a shift in women being in charge. So therefore, I want to make mention too that if you have um, a colleague, how would you know if they are undergoing some sort of problem? Well, I mentioned before some of the signs, they, they are getting irritable at work, they're not sleeping well, they, they come to the work looking unkempt, they might be smelling of alcohol. All these are things, signs you look out, they have red eyes, if they're on drugs. These are things you have to look out in your colleagues to see if they are in some way being um, distressed. And, um, and, and you remember, there was, a, there was a professor, Damian Rich, in the University of Westminster. He said financial problems and relationship breakups are behind many suicides. So if you don't want if your colleagues catch the tail to pay their mortgage, 
I hope you all have like loans to give your officers, right? This is something we try to, to because even young doctors now, yeah. young doctors only are getting three months contract. They can't buy a mortgage. My wife and I could have gotten mortgages each because we were a house officers. Now young doctors only get a three months contract. So if you know, if you know there's financial issues, if you know there is a breakup, you watch that person carefully. If you know that um, your friend uses alcohol and suffers from um, the burnout, again, that's another warning sign. So I always want to know. Um, because I, in St. Dan's Hospital, when I worked there for years, three doctors and you killed themselves, right? One was a, a Filipino doctor, one was a Nigerian doctor, and lastly, one was another doctor who shot himself. He got a legal family shot himself. Um, so what that tells us, we who are supposed to recognize depression among people missed it in our colleagues. So my thing is, you have to look and see if somebody is depressed, how would you know that person may now move from just depression to be a suicidal risk factor? If they had a previous attempt at suicide, or you see marks with self-cutting, this is a danger. If they have a family history of suicide and self-harm, because we found that if your first degree relatives kill themselves, you could now um, use that as a way out. If you're using substance abuse, alcohol, drugs, if you have the lethal beams of suicide, which you all do, if you have chronic pain illness, you get a chronic illness, you can't walk because of arthritis, that could trigger that. And um, so living alone too. So if any of your colleagues renting alone, living alone, and you get that checklist and you see these things happening, reach out. How are you going, brother? Come, let's see. Let's see how we can help you. Let's see if you get a loan for you. Let's see if we can engage you to come. But you know what is it difficult? A lot of men do not come for help. A lot of men refuse help. And this is our challenge. So we can see somebody depressed. I have a mother with a 17-year-old child. The child is depressed. The child is suicidal. The child tried to hang himself with a guitar cord. And the child would not come for treatment. And you see, we have to develop places where we can carry people who are suicidal. Nice places, not places that are dirty. Places where you can carry them to actually do healing. Get away from the world. Step out from the, the rat race. Find yourself. Do therapy. Do yoga. Do exercise. And then go back on. So we have to now develop that in our country. So therefore, those are... Um, that mother, she said, Doc, I can't sleep. Because any noise I hear any night, I don't know if he's going to try this again. We had to get a nurse, a retired nurse, to go and stay with them. But the problem is, the child don't want to take tablets. And tablet is not the be and at all. You have to have a mindset. You have to get rid of your negative thoughts. You have to do something called CBT. And the child just does not want. So this is um, a disaster that might be waiting to happen. So therefore, we have to be found that people who have a strong sense of purpose and self-esteem, like you have a goal, look, after I retire, I go to open up a little place. If you have a positive outlook, if you could, if you have life skills, um, out there that you could you could you, even if you have a church or a temple group where you now figure you could go and help people you feel good you go and you help in your community you get that one little smile you feel good and then social connectivity connectivity with family and friends importance also i always mention again the chill period when you come home peer support is problem and this is something where a study had shown that police officers who moved from the um the um urban areas to the rural areas do better in terms of stress. So sometimes you may have to say, do you want to take a rotation in one of the country areas? Or when you're working out on the field, is it wise now to put you on a desk job for a two weeks rotation just to get away from that, that rush? Uh, is it good now to have um, among your, your, your people, uh, football, little clubs, other activities that outside the work? So therefore, um, so we really have to detect stress and we have to have the support systems in place. So therefore, men will come and say, look doc, physically I have fatigue, headaches, dizziness, I have confusion, poor concentration, poor memory, depressed anger, irritability, I start to get on antisocial, isolated, losing appetite, etc., increasing alcohol. Those are the signs you have to, to look out for. And I mentioned before absenteeism, reduced productivity, uncharacteristic behavior. So you know this police officer for years and all of a sudden he's acquired for life, he's had to get on loud. Or one who always loud, getting on quiet. A change in behavior, a change in appetite, a change in sleep pattern. But you may not know about the sleep pattern, a low morale, a lack of cooperation, he doesn't care to take complaints or always tiredness, complaints of physical pains and aches. Those people may have underlying disorders. And um, so therefore, 
how does stress um, progress? Well, stress could affect um, um, stress could affect you differently. Yeah? The heart, um, the skin, joints, um, stomach. They give you ulcers. Sometimes you feel that that. Um, extra acid, um, it can affect your immune system. So definitely, um, you find that, 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 that stress um, does major harm to your body. So we have to recognize it and get it. So people come in with headaches, irritability, ang anger. And, and the thing is, if somebody is suicidal, they may now be looking at ways to kill themselves. So they go into the office and they're on the phone looking at ways to kill themselves. They may be saying goodbye to the bachelor, you are a good partner boy. I want to, I want to give you my, my um, DVD collection. All those are signs that they may be planning to kill themselves. So therefore you have to look at that person. You have to see if we could reach out. And don't mistake bravado for um, a depression for bravado. You see, sometimes you're depressed and you lose your impulse. You're depressed and you don't just go in a corner and look down. You just don't care about life. So you and your partners go into a house, you go in and brave. And all the fellows say, hey, you are really brave boy. You are really brave. He doesn't care for his life. He might be acting on impulse. He might be acting on the fact that we really care again and he goes up. So therefore, therefore, you have to appreciate that that individual could also be depressed. Um, the other thing I want to mention too, we found that men are more subject to loneliness than women after divorce because they enjoy less solid social networks and tend to be less supportive to one another. Now my friends and I had arguments about this eh? because you may find a guy is a player. He wants to get divorced to play because his wife, he just wants to get out of his marriage. He might be not a problem. But the other problems, who somebody who was really wanted the marriage to work, that individual could wallow in depression. And statistics show that women cope with separation far better than men. Uh, they will come for counsel, but the men are the ones who, uh, who um, are actually getting the problems. Now, as I go on to this, I want to say I need men to come out of the closet. I don't mean come out of the closet sexually. I mean come out of the closet with your mental state, right? So, because how else we would know you suffering, right? Men are told not to cry because this symbolizes weakness. Not to fail because failure means you are not man enough not to seek help because only women do that. However, talking about one problems with a friend, family, uh, could give you therapeutic relief. relief. You, you have to come to terms with your feelings. And these figures I showed you all from worldwide figures show you're going to get worse than men, unless you all know, um, well I should say, man up or woman up and take treatment. Eh? You have to get treatment. You have to come in, you have to talk, you have to get that healthy aspects. So what solutions? You all have the AAP, AAP um, employees um, assistance program. But st a local studies show that some people don't like to go there. They'll forget everybody know their business. That the other colleagues will know their business and they're not really depressed and they don't want that. So I could understand that. So therefore I want to say, but, but studies have shown by a guy called Donnelly, he said that how officers with work-related stress had um, a this diminished when they utilized the institutional support systems such as the employee assistance programs. But if you don't want to go there because you figure your business will be on the street, the Ministry of Health has launched its Fine Care TT app. Fine Care TT app is if you go in that app, you may see the Psychology Association you could talk to, and then I mentioned the 800 um, um, COPE before, and also our health centers. We have trained doctors in the normal health centers to deal with depression and schizophrenia. So if you look at the CEDAR program, there is Prozac for depression and Triplin for depression. So you could go to a normal health center and the doctor could start treatment here. If you find that he cannot manage, he'll send it to our psychiatric um, centers. But a lot of you will feel ashamed to come to a psychiatric clinic. So we have tried to name our psychiatric outpatient clinic in Barataria as a Barataria Community Mental Health and wellness clinic. But people say, though, we still know that it's from our people. So you still get that aspect of stigma. They don't want to come. So therefore, I want to tell you, there are other avenues. You could, you could, you could also now go to the Ministry of Family. 
have social services and family services. They have social workers, they have psychologists. So nobody's seen you going to a mental health clinic. So sometimes people come to me, they say they're not coming back because too much of strange people outside. I send them to social services. So they get counseling, I want to make sure they get counseling. And then, um, then um, the idea is, I remember supervisors from the community-oriented policy unit of Trinidad and Tobago, you all had participated in a mental health psychosocial support, MHPSS training, to help your colleagues. And this is something I think um, is something we need to continue. I think the, the um, US Embassy was given some funding, and at least if we could train a few peers here to look out, it means we can, we can actually be helping this problem. There are non-governmental organizations like Families in Action. And therefore, it's really, it's really to, to find that support out there and realize you could tap into it. So um, there was a study in Trinidad in 2021, policing and international, uh, published in the International Journal of Police um, Strategies and Management. And it shows that officers in the region have become increasingly burdened with heavy workloads and with the responsibility of enjoying an increasing number of crime fighting strategies and, ap and approaches that are implemented. So sometimes you are called now to report more, to give more, more reports, you don't have to staff. And all these things are, are things that you're faced with. And they found that officers in high crime areas are more likely to have higher levels of stress than work working in low crime areas, which is something you didn't need a study for that. And then they found that, um, that um, adverse conditions, so I'll go through these quickly now, adverse conditions, like for instance, if you have shift work, um, traumatic events could increase the risk of, of, of distress, excessive administrative duties, um, I mentioned. Then, um, then the increase, as I said, in, in, in burnout, we'll be getting in some officers also. They have, um, Officers complain about the promotion, retirement, you have to wait for your retirement um, grant and monies. All these are things that could, could make you feel distressed, your personal problems. Um, also, you find that um, there were other studies where you found that um, uh, if you had, for instance, police officers um, reported high levels of police stress were at an increased risk. So if you have high stress, you increase risk for a number of adverse health outcomes, especially depression, anxiety, burnout, um, PTSD. So def definitely, um, we have to get rid of that, that, that stress level. Because remember, you are out there dealing with the public. The public may see uh, angry persona, they may see a gruff persona, but it's your job has actually made you into that because you do not get enough um, downtime home, you do not get your, your real time home and you just have that office persona. So therefore, um, I want to say is that sometimes it's challenging to get you guys, or men on the whole, to come into treatment. So sometimes men are their worst enemies. So we have to break that cycle. We have to encourage you to utilize the services. We have to um, encourage you that it is worldwide. It is not just police officers, it is other officers, but police officers with their macho image have a harder barrier to break. So this is why we have to reach out. We have to get that cultural shift over to you guys. We have to also mention that, um, that the um, how, as I mentioned, how people cope varies. So we have to provide strategies how persons can cope. And we have to appreciate that there's something called first responder stress. Police are, are trusted in the cases of, they are pushed into homicide, vehicle accident, kidnapping, rapes, domestic abuse. You see the evil, you see the dark zone. And this could, this could trigger negative mental emotional behavioral symptoms. Some officers say, Doc, after a while we just don't care, you know, we just take it as part of the job. But some of them who try to help, try to solve, they may face with that. You're going to see these dead bodies. And, and, and prolonged patterns of these presentations, if you keep seeing this over and over, some officers get diagnosis as depression, acute stress disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. So based on one study, 15 to 18% of the New York police officers, NYPD officers, present with um, um, with post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't know the figures we have down here, um, but again, we know that there's the, the local studies that show burnout, etc., um, would affect us. 
So mental health is really not just the absence of a mental disease. That's how you can care about yourself in society, how you can um, feel satisfied, um, how you can actually um, um, be able to socialize out there and, and not isolate, not be caught up in delusions, emotions. So definitely mental illness is increasing. We need to safeguard the public, relatives, and yourself from emotional meltdown. So therefore, um, venues like this and, 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 and outreaches like this will help you guys if you could spread that word. Um, um, I mentioned again that, um, that um, you have to deal with things out there that sometimes um, beyond your control. But again, we find group therapy, talking to your other persons, you can get that support, you know. Like if you have an officer who always coming down on you, you could actually, uh, you could actually get support from your other colleagues. It's not really you alone, it's that his mate, yeah. And, and some officers I know enjoy themselves. They don't care about anything happening to them. They are what we call the preeners. They come and they shine up their buttons, they cut uniform, and they love their job. Because putting on that outfit is like bat Batman, putting on a cape. That person in uniform is something that, that, that really elevates them. So therefore, um, a message I want to make too is don't complicate your life. As the Commissioner Police said, um, you know, she was trying to say the, the home, the wife, don't complicate yourself with too many um, side um, tricks, as I want to put it, because that could lead to problems, as I mentioned before. That could lead, don't you know what you can handle, right? So this is something you have to, to know. Um, yeah, huh? you, have to know, you have to know what you can handle, but I'm saying, um, your, and your jobs, again, should demand you get that downtime. So we need to get that downtime. You have to demand it as part of your, of your uh, career that you have to get that downtime. And um, the other thing I have to say is that I, um, I saw the idea of balance has to come in. Balance has to come in. And I mentioned the fact that cortisol and adrenaline is a hell of a thing if it's there all the time. Some, per, some um, individuals, as police officers, financial difficulties, they moonlight, they go guard in certain places. Nothing wrong with that, you know. But once you're having your sleep, once you could get your sleep, you can't just be after money, 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 because you'll end up now affecting your, yourself. Huh? And um, so, so, remember, you all have one of the most stressful occupations where you continue, continually face physical dangers and put your lives on the line at any time that can happen. Um, so, um, what I want to say as I am about to close is your, your combined, um, combined um, stresses could, could make anyone um, sink into depression, could make anyone um, get on an aggressive manner. And sometimes it can trigger um, a chronic stress disorder, post-traumatic stress um, disorder. Sometimes the American um, Psychiatric Association um, mentioned the fact that um, any officers who are involved in any sort of violent crime should come in and talk just to get it off their chest to see how they will deal with it. Understand that alcohol could be a problem if misused. Understand that spirituality will have a place in your life or self-development. And, um, and um, the other thing too is, um, as I want to, to get you that um, mental health really is you individual realizing your own ability to cope with your job, to normal stresses of life. If you could work productive and fruitful and able to make a contribution to community. If you find you're getting challenged for that, I say you have to reach out to help, to get help. And I have told you certain places that we can get help. And sometimes you are, um, as I'm saying, you are prone to violence, not just outside, but we are now seeing an increasing um, phenomena of death rage. And death rage comes like where people are irritable and you working in a desk job with somebody and they just angry, angry, angry. And even so, even though while we thought the office setting was a safe domain, you have to see what, what is presented um, to you. So therefore, you have to recognize mental distress in the caucus, and this is what I'm pleading. You have to understand that any sort of changes, be on the red alert because it can embarrass your profession, crying, anger, irritability, lack of emotion, difficulty in thinking, promiscuous behavior, change in person. These are things you have to, to be on the out guard for. So this is what I want to get. Always give 100% at work, but not like this. 
You saw this guy gives 100% at different days, like sit to take give, try and give 100%. That should be things. You, you are there to serve my thing. But besides just giving 100% of your work, you have to give 100% to yourself or to you. You have to treat yourself before you can treat the world, before you can go off. Your job can kill you both in terms of the danger out there and the stress can also kill you. So one quarter of employees view their jobs as the number one stressor in their lives. So as I end, I say I know you guys have batch loyalty. So I'm, I'm pleading to you that batch loyalty should not just be defending one another in the field, but taking care and recognizing the others at their weakest point and encouraging them to get help. Thank you.